Hello, Thomas Hillen Eriksson, still on fieldwork in Gladstone, Queensland, looking at um, local responses to accelerated change, chiefly in the domain of industry. You know, I think in order to understand the place that industry has in Gladstone, the privileged place of industry, the commitment to living in an industrial town <coughs> and being proud of it and encouraging new developments and trying to uh, well let industry have its way as long as possible in order to understand this we've got to take a look at the history of Gladstone for a hundred years Gladstone was a backwater it had been designated to be the capital of the colony of northern Queensland as early as 1847 when William Gladstone himself was a colonial secretary in London and that's why that's how the town got its name. He was never here of course, hardly heard about the place but it was named for him. Nothing came about, uh, nothing sort of happened uh, in that respect. Uh, instead uh, the colony of Queensland was eventually founded with Brisbane as its uh, capital and Gladstone went back into oblivion and remained a dusty country town uh, based around a few small activities such as the meatworks which was the main source of employment for the men for many years until it closed down in 1963 and as a minor port for shipments of various foodstuffs and timber you know grains uh, meat that sort of thing um, until the 1960s so it was a town of just a few thousand people uh, and languishing in the shadow of the more important towns such as Maryborough, Bundaberg and Rockhampton in the region. Then came QAL as it is commonly known Queensland Alumina Limited and set up shop built what was then the world's largest aluminium refinery or sorry alumina refinery uh, just south of the city uh, in uh, the 1960s opened in 1967 the next year a railway extension um, enabled the city to become an exporter of uh, coal in a large way it had been a small scale exporter of coal before but now it could become a much larger exporter of coal because one then was connected directly to the coal mines in the interior of Queensland. A few years later the power station that we're just going to pass now in a minute or two um, was built <coughs> an important coal uh, fired uh, power station which uh, provides uh, this part of the country with much of its uh, electricity and not least the industry uh, and the port was also soon expanded. So in the 1960s and 70s Gladstone also underwent a uh, process of accelerated change with a lot of people moving in, with a lot of turmoil, with a lot of newcomers and, uh, and tensions and frictions but on the whole a positive um, feel uh, where, where people finally had the feeling that the wait was over. As the, the, the most authoritative history of the Gladstone is called by Lorna MacDonald, a local historian, Gladstone, the city that waited. And it had been waiting for a hundred years. And towards the end, in the final chapters of the book, there is a rather sort of accelerated feel to the style of the author as she describes the many advances and the many forms of progress that had been made in such a short time, turning this dusty backwater of a country town into a major industrial hub and a centre for industrial development. And this has continued. QAL remains a cornerstone um, enterprise in the community. It employs more than a thousand people plus around 400 uh, subcontractors. Rio Tinto, the mining giant which owns 80% of QAL, also bought up the power station some 30 years ago and uh, has built a second alumina refinery a bit further up at Yarbon. In fact I'm driving in that direction right now but I'm not going quite as far as Yarwin because I have another destination in mind. So that has to be taken into account and it also means that being an environmentalist, being critical of industry in a city like Gladstone can be a very hard thing indeed. It can be difficult because one is uh, perceived as being uh, a winter and someone who doesn't understand the significance of progress and someone who wants to turn the clock back. 
we are now passing a number of buses on our right. These would be FIFOs, fly-in, fly-out workers. They're not flying in or out. Well, they may be flying out actually now, who come from Curtis Island, from the gas refineries, and who work as construction workers in the gas refineries. Very well-paid work, very hard. They have a roster of often three weeks on, one week off, where they work long hours, and uh, those people would now have either the weekend off, this is Saturday afternoon, or perhaps a full week off, in which case it would be heading for the airport. But anyway, this is a city committed to its industrial identity. But let me just, towards the end, I'm going to turn this off now, um, very soon, tell you a little story about the QAL. Because the thing is that the QAL is located in the southern, uh, out on the southern outskirts of Gladstone. And the prevailing winds are southeasterly. So, which means that anything in terms of emissions from QAL and its neighboring factory, the Boeing smelter, which smelts some of the alumina into aluminium, um, would be blown towards uh, the city. Some people complain about asthma. Some people complain about other respiratory ailments. Um, quite, quite many, in fact, report that blah, when they went on holiday to Thailand on the Sunshine Coast, their symptoms uh, disappeared momentarily, not to return until they came back to Gladstone. In other words, they're having concern about the quality of the air. Um, and there are whistleblowers. There are people who claim to have documented, for example, a high incidence of leukemia in children. But the numbers are so small, of course, that they can be written off as not being statistically significant. Nevertheless, there are concerns. People who have voiced these concerns have done so at, great, at a great personal price, because as one of them says, a whistleblower called Ian Woodhouse, who no longer lives in Ladson, who got leukemia, who was virtually dying, but who recovered thanks to a successful bone marrow uh, transplant and who uh, connects his illness and that of others with uh, particles in the air, having breathed in particles in the air year in and year out. Now he tells me that uh, it could be unpleasant to be a whistleblower, to criticize industry, to ask them to get their act together, to ask them to install you know, more protective measures, to ask the authorities, the state government, the council, to be more uh, severe on, uh, on industry and to monitor it more closely. It has its price. He um, received a number of unpleasant messages, you might say. There, were, there was a feeling that this kind of intervention was not entirely welcome in the community, which for 45 years or more has thrived on the combination of um, cheap energy, a good deep sea port, and a, and a, and a, and a secure and uh, stable supply of raw materials for its many industries. See you later.